I have to, to begin with a, a disclaimer that as a federal employee, I cannot endorse any particular company over any other. So uh, I can come and tell you what we did. So I report, you decide. When you think of fish genomics, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is zebrafish because there's been so much work done on it. It's an excellent vertebrate model uh, for development. But the, my main problem with zebrafish is it takes way too many to make a decent meal. <laughs> so that's why we work with catfish. All right. So uh, there are about 30, I think 34 families uh, uh, taxonomically of catfish. It's a very successful clade. Uh, from the order Siluriformes. They're all over the earth. The earth is full of catfish. And uh, we're really interested uh, in two of them, and that would be the, uh, the channel catfish and the blue catfish, which are native to North America, uh, mostly between the two mountain ranges, the Appalachians and the, and the Rockies. The channel has a, a little bit uh, more, you know, just all of uh, the central part of North America originally, but it's been introduced uh, throughout the, the country and then uh, in other countries as well. Uh, the blue catfish, blue catfish has uh, more of a uh, more southern uh, range down into Mexico. Uh, the uh, catfish are, you might be surprised, the fourth most eaten seafood in the United States after shrimp, salmon, and canned tuna. And uh, most or all of those are imported. Uh, the farm-raised catfish then are a domestic product for the most part, although we, we eat so much we actually import uh, some catfish as well. Uh, primarily produced in, in Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, a few other uh, states like North Carolina and Texas, uh, mostly because of, uh, of the weather, you know, hoping it's a cold-blooded animal and warm water is uh, its favorite thing to happen. 40% uh, of production is the channel catfish. Historically, that was all of production. Then in the past several years, the, uh, a hybrid between the blue catfish and the channel has uh, come online. The, the producers have learned how to produce them more efficiently, and it's a very good production fish. So um, that's why we are interested in, in the blue. It is a very mild tasting fish. If you've never tried to eat it, you go down to the, the street here to the fish house, they have it on the menu. Uh, it, it works well in lots of different cuisines. And no less an authority than Mark Twain said that the catfish is a good enough fish for anyone. <laughs> and I would only modify that slightly to say that catfish is a good enough fish for everyone. So, uh, and it's also seen as a, you know, a very uh, sustainable fish because it is a, a native species. It has uh, mostly a vegetarian diet. We don't need to pull in fish uh, from the ocean to, to feed it. Uh, and um, often seen as the best choice for, for things like you know, the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch. So w with the USDA, we are tasked uh, by our stakeholders, the producers and processors, uh, with developing um, improved catfish germplasm and improved lines. And we do have a selection program that recently uh, we have turned into a uh, genomic selection. Uh, we do, and uh, you can see some of the other things we're taxed with here as well. And so uh, we did have, let me start first with uh, one of the, the, the things that really helped us was our ability to make homozygous fish. And so by treating uh, the sperm with ultraviolet light and cross-linking that DNA, it still can activate the egg. Uh, you go through normal karyokinesis, but then by pressure shocking the eggs for three minutes just before the first cell division, you uh, mess up the, mitotic, or the, the spindles, uh, the mitotic spindle apparatus. And so the maternal complement is duplicated, and so you restore the, the diploid condition. So these fish have a completely homozygous genome. Now that is a, a very low efficiency process. You put thousands of eggs through the, the pressure shock and you get a few that survive. Uh, but they're very precious. So the, uh, the channel catfish genome that we produced using short read technology was produced from a fish that we named Coco. And we named her Coco after Coco Chanel, you know, the, the uh, fashion maven because our fish is channel number one. 
you know. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be telling that later at supper, right? Yeah. All right, so it's, it's kind of a typical, it was a good alumina assembly, uh, but a kind of a typical one that you can kind of see through the holes in it, right? You know, a lot of gaps, um, lots of contigs, uh, you know, almost 10,000 scaffolds. Uh, the scaffold in 50 was seven megabases. We were very proud of that, you know, and this is uh, published in 2016, but that is so last decade, you know? So we're so used to that. So first of all, we wanted to get the, uh, you may like this one too. All right, so the double haploid blue, we named her Billy after Billie Holiday, queen of the blues, right? Ah, I like it, okay. So um, we, we used uh, PacBio RS2 reads, got a lot of DNA, but it took us about 100 flow cells to get this much uh, sequence off of it. But it did produce a pretty, you know, a much better assembly than uh, the, the short read one, As, and that's, that's not news. So uh, we had a pretty good, uh, you know, the contigs were almost as big as the scaffolds in the other. All right, but as my, my colleague who, uh, we worked together on this, John Liu at Auburn, who's now at Syracuse University, uh, as he's quoted, you should always sequence your genome in the future, all right, because the, uh, the technology just continues to develop. So we thought we would redo COCO. We had some uh, DNA left, and that was with the sequel. And you can see that eight flow cells on the sequel gave us more DNA, longer DNA, a better assembly. Um, we, uh, we liked using canoe. Sergey is here. He will tell you it's the best one. So, uh, yeah, we've had very good, um, good assemblies using canoe. Yeah. So the next step then was to, uh, to put those together. Now, the, the previous Illumina assembly, we were able to assemble into chromosome linked scaffolds by uh, comparing that to a genetic linkage map that we had from, uh, with a lot of SNP loci. And so we were able to, to get those onto chromosomes. Uh, this time, we had the opportunity to, uh, to get the, uh, the sapphire instrument. And so uh, it only took just a few microliters. Uh, fish have nucleated red blood cells, and it doesn't take much to, uh, you know, to embed in the agarose plugs. And you see COCO DNA, I had, I had put, uh, embedded that uh, in, in Agros plugs, I think in 2006 or 2007, uh, because we thought, well, maybe we may make a back library from, from COCO, all right? Never, never used it, just left it in the fridge. So moral of the story is don't throw anything away, <laughs> ever. So, so we used, uh, actually the very first uh, BioNano run as it was being set up, was uh, using the, uh, the blue catfish DNA. That was just the installment and uh, worked really well. You know, we got lots of, uh, lots of DNA and, you know, looks like it's supposed to look with, uh, with, with good labeling. So you can see the, uh, the number of molecules, it was, it was kind of stunning. You know, it's, it's rare that you get an instrument installed and it works wow, you know, the very first thing that you do on it. Sometimes it takes a few, a few times to get your uh, technology running. Blue ran very well. Channel not as much, but that's okay. They were 11 years old, you know, and uh, still I think it worked pretty well. So good enough that if we could use a 200 KB minimum, we still end up with, you know, 90, 95% of the reads um, or of, the, uh, of the molecules. So that worked out pretty well. Um, you can see, you know, pretty long average. And so then we used the, uh, the BioNano software then to produce a, a de novo assembly of the maps themselves. And, you know, at first you think, what went, you know, this can't be right, that it's only 75 maps, you know. Are you kidding me? And uh, it wasn't kidding me, you know. So that was, that was really uh, encouraging to see, and I think, you know, our map link was pretty similar between the two. I think the species maybe diverged from a common ancestor about seven million years ago. The sequences are about 5% difference between the channel and the blue. So, so that's not uh, too, too odd to think that, that uh, you know, the genomes are pretty similar. Plus they make the, the, uh, the viable hybrid. All right, so here's, you know, kind of the, the standard you can see with the, this coverage was, 
was pretty good. This is one of the, the longer contigs in, uh, in the blue catfish. It is um, 40 megabases, and that's, you know, that's about as long as, as we can get for a chromosome arm. We don't get these really huge long chromosomes, uh, but that's fine with me, you know, because we cover them pretty well. If we zoom in a little bit, you know, you can see it is pretty good labeling. I don't know if the labeling is going to show up as well as, uh, as you could see it there, but that's why you should always sit in the front row, because you can see that uh, really well. Okay. Uh, and then we uh, utilized the, the pack bioassembly uh, along with the maps there to produce a, a scaffold, you know, the hybrid scaffold. And you can see on the, on the top that the, uh, the, the, uh, the sequence contigs you know, are, are uh, splicing in there pretty well uh, to make a, here's the bio nano map uh, for this particular uh, scaffold and then you, you know you end up with the scaffold there so that worked out uh, you know pretty nicely here's here's another that's you know in the 30 megabase range and then we you know we have some that don't go quite as long uh, about 16 so you know at the at that point I thought well you know I wonder why but but uh, it'll be obvious later all right so you can see that uh, just the scaffolding process in the blue catfish um, you know, reduced the, uh, the number of scaffolds quite a bit. Just the, the sequence assembly was able to bring a few of these bio nano maps together. Uh, same thing in the, in the channel. Uh, so, you know, in 50 length in the, you know, 20 to 25, uh, the assembly was, was reasonable. Uh, and more so, you know, 834, I think we were 780 or 790 in the, uh, the short read uh, assembly. So, you know, we were able to incorporate more as one might expect with, with long read assembly. And only about 3% of, uh, of the sequence assembly could not be incorporated into the, the maps. And I think a, a pretty good amount of that actually was just centromeric sequence. So here is an example of uh, what Victor alluded to, uh, where when you look at the overlap uh, one of the nice things, and I'll zoom in on this, one of the nice things about the, uh, the, the software is that you can actually see, okay, it's got an overlap. You can estimate that, you know, that's maybe KB or two uh, of an overlap. You know, is it real? And so what I did, not knowing any better and not being more skilled bioinformatically, was just to, uh, to bring the hybrid scaffold uh, out and look for this signal of 13 ends which is what the software uses to um, designate an overlap. All right, and so when I went to those sites and then just randomly, you know, maybe chose a 50 base pair sequence to search for and, you know, wham, it shows, you know, it's very easy just to manually trim off the overlap. And so I was able to trim off about 100 uh, of these overlaps uh, for, for each of those assemblies this way. And, you know, tedious was the right word, but, you know, you put on some classical music, you close the door, and, and, uh, <laughs> and it happens. Okay. All right, so also using the genetic linkage map, then we could take these hybrid scaffolds in, and put them in, uh, into chromosomes. And <clears throat> one of the nice things about the... Uh, the, uh, the long read assembly is there was a very nice signal for centromeric DNA. Uh, in fact, one of our scientists who um, came in uh, to our lab as a postdoc uh, years ago took one of the, the known repeats and did some uh, in situ hybridization and, and uh, lo and behold, we figured, you know, that's probably a centromere. So just by searching for that sequence, there it was on the end of these uh, bio nano hybrid scaffolds. All right, so there was the centromere, and the telomeric sequence was, was a kind of canonical sequence, and that was easy to find. So it was, it was really easy. It's, it, was, it wasn't even the, the four puzzle piece, it was a four piece puzzle, it was like the one and a half piece puzzle. Really easy to put together compared to, you know, the, the month that I spent doing that uh, <laughs> with the door closed and the classical music on the short read assembly. So this is what the, I'm just showing the channel catfish now, it's a little bit better assembly than the blue, uh, still 
doing some, some work to close gaps. So you can see in red the telomeres, in blue the centromeres. It's, I, I grew up in a cytogenetics lab. My major professor would croak if he saw how messy this is. And it's you know, not the, the typical ideogram. But uh, we're just trying to stay um, within the same parameters as the original assembly that's in NCBI. In. And at this point, I don't think it really matters for our purposes. All right, so we were able to, uh, to find centromeres for almost all of them. There are a few, like chromosome 17, where we didn't have a, a centromeric signal. It ended at some larger repetitive sequence. And, one of the, and I think you know, one of these smaller unmapped uh, contigs is probably uh, at the telomere, you know, just on the other side. So it's probably more like a, a telocentric chromosome. But, uh, but I couldn't get the, the other side of the centromere mapped based on our genetic linkage map. There weren't any markers that matched. All right. Now this gives you a sense of how many scaffolds it took to produce uh, each chromosome. So you can see chromosome one was done with two scaffolds. All right. This is, uh, you know, the short arm was one scaffold, hybrid scaffold. This is uh, a second one. I think our, our uh, chromosome number four here, there's one, two, three, four, five. It went together with five bionic scaffolds. So, you know, that's cooking. That's not bad at all. So we're, uh, we're pretty happy with that. And now maybe looking to see if we can um, close in some of, the, some of the gaps. Some will be uh, harder to do than others. But this uh, is just to give you a direct comparison between the, uh, so for example, chromosome one in uh, the first cocoa assembly that was lumina based had 13 scaffolds, uh, 1,115 gaps within and you know, between scaffolds. And you can see we were able to put those together based on the, uh, the genetic map. Now compare that with uh, the, uh, the PAC bio slash optical map um, assembly, and you see we have two scaffolds and two gaps up here in the, uh, the short arm, and that's it. This is all solid all the way down. And uh, they're not all like that. Of course, I'm not going to show you the worst one, but yeah, but that's, that's pretty good. And those gaps, you know, like 8.5 KB and 42 KB, so that's going to take a uh, a little more effort to try to, to try to breach that, but um, you know functionally that's that's not so bad. And if you compare them on a dot plot, you can see um, here on the on the y-axis is the uh, Illumina chromosome one, x-axis, x-axis the, the catfish chromosome one, and they go together pretty well. And in fact, if we uh, zoom up this little area here, it's kind of interesting. You can see uh, Illumina scaffolds that were misoriented during that because our genetic map just didn't have the resolution to, to orient at that level. You know, we got them kind of close. So, you know, that's the advantage here of, of this assembly. Um, now here's just a comparison of the, of the blue catfish um, chromosome one with the channel chromosome one. And, uh, you know, you can see they're, they're, they're you know, nicely collinear. We have some, some weird things like right here, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting, you know, and looking forward to, uh, to going, there. it's not the centromere. Uh, so, you know, it'll be fun to look in and uh, do some, some comparative uh, analysis. So in conclusion, you know, maybe don't wait for the future for your assembly. It's, it's probably gonna be, you know, now's the time. So, you know, long read sequencing, optical map, uh, we didn't use high C because we had the genetic map to, uh, to put them onto chromosomes. So you, know, you can see we made some pretty dramatic um, improvements in contiguity. Uh, provides basically chromosome arm scaffolding. Yeah, and that's, that's good enough for me. Um, and it did, really didn't take much, much sample either. You know, it, and, that, and that was kind of surprising. I'll, how much uh, information we got from just a few microliters of nucleated blood. Uh, another thing I like about the optical maps is uh, you, you have, a, I think, a good estimate of your gap lengths because of the labeling through the gap and the, the estimation of, of, the, of the length. So when you look at that 
um, you know, you, it's, I think it's just a tighter uh, amount of information that you can get uh, from the Bio Nano data. Um, and, and again, it was just a beautiful correlation with the genetic map. So, so very happy. All right. uh, so I would like to acknowledge um, Brian Scheffler, who's here uh, as the leader, research leader of the Genomics and Bioinformatics Research Unit at Stoneville. Uh, and his people, um, Sharon did the, uh, the PAC bio work. Linda Ballard is uh, in informatics. Cal Youngblood uh, runs the, the Sapphire and uh, does, does really nice work now. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Stefan and uh, Yun Yun for their uh, support and their help kind of get us running and, and understanding what we're looking at. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. And go out and eat some catfish sometime. <laughs>